So hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming to the Arid Lands Environment Centre's webinar on the draft uh, Western Davenport Water Allocation Plan. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting on Central Aranda Country here in Mbantua in Alice Springs. I would like to acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging, um, and also acknowledge uh, that in terms of the context that we're talking about today is on Kadich, Walmampa, Walpuri, Aliwarada, Baramangu, um, and Amajara country today. And I would like to acknowledge um, the custodianship of Aboriginal people around water um, since time in memoriam. Uh, so today uh, we're talking about the draft Western Davenport Water Allocation Plan in which the Environment Centre is extremely concerned about uh, and think it captures is a, it's come appearing at a time um, where there's a lot of conflict around water resource management in the Northern Territory. And this water plan uh, is a really useful case study um, to better understand these issues. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. So there'll be maybe a 30 minute presentation and then hopefully about you know, lots of time for questions and discussion. Um, this is a really laid issue. Um, we're talking about um, a semi-arid environment uh, in the Barclay region, about three hours north of Alice Springs, uh, and water ex and huge volume of water extraction. So in regards to today's agenda, um, we'll start with some different statements and perspectives. Uh, then we'll go through the, uh, the NT kind of water context. So just admitting a few more people. Um, then focus on why we're talking about the Western Davenports um, as a region. Um, we'll go through water water allocation plan and we'll go through our concerns, um, Alex's concerns and what can be done and finishing off with questions as well. Um, I'm also um, wondering, Jackie, if or someone, if they have Alex's uh, submission guide on them, whether they can put that in the chat as well. So I thought I'd start with um, Maureen uh, Napajimpa O'Keefe. I'm very fortunate to work closely with her, and she had hoped to be here today, but unfortunately is unwell. But she provided this short statement that I'd just like to read out. Doesn't the government care about our people? Our lives matter. Everything needs water to survive. I think the government should stop this. They are putting lives at risk. Water is life. People won't survive without water. This water is for the insects, plants, animals, and people. We must hold the government accountable for this. We should protest against this government in Darwin about this water business. And I think it's really important um, that we consider these perspectives, um, and Maureen is a Kadich Walpuri woman um, and a custodian for sites that are affected in this water allocation plan. I also think it's a good opportunity to um, hear about some other perspectives, including community leader Graeme Beasley, um, who said uh, in the ABC yesterday that traditional owners will get sick if they can't protect their water sites. That's our culture. We can't give it away. They've already taken everything. What more do they want? Similarly, the CEO of the Central Land Council emphasised that Minister, Moss's, Lauren, Minister Lauren Moss's address to the United Nations General Assembly last month was at odds with the government's continued and complete contempt for Aboriginal cultural and environmental values when it comes to water planning. And it goes on to say, any drop in the water table risks irreversible damage to sacred, sacred springs, soakages and trees. Our country and culture will be sacrificed if water extraction is not carefully managed and limited. and Alex's position, and we're calling for uh, the Western Davenport Water Allocation Plan to be scrapped. Uh, we find this a hugely controversial document. It's been, and I'll, we'll go through this in a lot more detail, but it's been gutted of meaningful content. It's seeking to prevent future opportunity for litigation, uh, and it will not protect uh, ecological and cultural values, which rely on the shallow groundwater system of the Western Davenport region. Uh, I also think it's really important that we consider kind of what is the broader context of water. Uh, we've seen just in the last three years, we've seen policy scrutiny committees uh, be scrapped 
And it's important to note that, that we are in the Northern Territory. We've got one House of Parliament. We have no Senate. Um, so scrapping of policy scrutiny committees means that kind of the only vehicle for scrutiny uh, has been lost. Um, we've seen huge, um, we've seen huge, uh, the Territory Economic Reconstruction Final Report um, has been a, the Northern Territory Government's blueprint for kind of economic management. We've seen major attempts to um, amend the Water Act without consultation, and we've seen huge water licenses. We've also seen targeted attempts to undermine water allocation plans, which we'll talk about today, um, as well as the emergence of floodplain harvesting policy. And right now, more amendments are to the Water Act, which will impact kind of transparency and scrutiny around mining licenses. And then ongoing, there's major issues with safe drinking water across the Northern Territory, whether that's due to water quantity or quality issues due to heavy metals, uranium or salts in the water supply. But I think it's really important when we're talking about water and a water context to really emphasize the economic context that water is positioned within. So at the end of 2020, um, similarly in the way that Scott Morrison um, developed a gas lead recovery, um, a similar person, Andrew Liveris, who sat on that panel, was the chair of the Territory Economic Reconstruction Commission. Uh, and the Territory has its own kind of gas lead recovery and water lead recovery. And this is, this is the Turk. And what we're seeing in the last few years is kind of the Turk playing out. Uh, so what does the Turk say? Uh, it, it's trying to grow the Northern Territory economy from $26 billion in 2020 to $40 billion in 2030. And it's very explicit in being kind of an investor-led approach and literally wants to take the red carpet to the investors um, and making the Territory an easy place to do business and a key pillar of that, in addition to gas, in addition to minerals and uh, resource extraction, is water. Um, water for supporting those enterprises, but also water for irrigated water culture. So why are we talking about the Western Davenports? Uh, in the Northern Territory, we have water plans, um, which is similar to many other jurisdictions nationally. Um, and the Western Davenports, currently the water existing water allocation plan has lapsed. And this is a two uh, a new a new document, uh, and this will be a ten year water plan. Uh, and this region is about three hundred kilometers north of Inbantua Alice Springs and hundred kilometers south of Tennant Creek, uh, and includes the remote community of Ali Kurung, as well as parts of the Davenport Ranges National Park, uh, and it's also home to uh, where the Singleton Station water license is found which is one of the largest water licenses in Australia. Um, and there's been a lot of scrutiny on this area. So what is a water plan? Uh, I guess just quickly, it's really important to emphasize that planning's rigor comes from the Water Act and that's the Water Act 1992 in the Northern Territory. And where, where kind of the Water Act is quite clear in section 22.4b that a water allocation plan and licensing decisions need to be made in accordance with the water allocation plan. This gives um, water planning uh, rigor and strength, and it's why plans matter. They basically shape the kind of development pathways um, that will emerge for the region. Uh, and licensing needs to be, it creates the rules and conditions for future water licenses, essentially. Um, so when we see licensing, that's like the Singleton Station license. Um, so planning flows out of the law and informs licensing. And I guess water allocation plans in theory are intended to assist governments and the community to manage a water resource, often when there's competing uses for water. So whether that's for drinking water, uh, for cultural uses of water, for the environment or for economic development or horticulture or pastoral. Um, and nationally, it's recognised for the National Water Initiative the water allocation plans are to be transparent, evidence-based, involve community input and secure ecological values um, by describing and mitigating environmental, cultural and social impacts. So what are Alex's concerns? We've got seven major concerns um, and that we'll go through, but I just guess from the top, we are calling for this plan to be scrapped and rewritten. Um, and we mean this in to the full extent, this is a really controversial plan um, that may contribute 
to catastrophic outcomes for ecological and cultural values for this region. So firstly, when we're talking about water allocation plan, the kind of key thing that water allocation plans do, um, which informs licensing, is it allocates a term called an estimated sustainable yield, just how much water can be allocated in that region. And we argue um, that simply it's too much water. Um, and part of this, in terms of the interaction between the law, planning and licensing, the Water Act in the Northern Territory is extremely weak. It's highly discretionary and it lacks clear direction in how uh, we can sustainably do things. So what I mean by that is like estimated sustainable yield as a term uh, is not defined. Um, so it doesn't meet, have to meet certain parameters. It doesn't mean anything um, uh, specifically under the Water Act. So in this region, um, there's 81.5 billion litres of water that's being allocated. Uh, and I guess for context, a Singleton license is one of the largest water licenses in Australia. And that about half of that volume will go to Singleton, um, which is 40 billion litres of water, 40 gigalitres. And 40 gigalitres is equal to uh, the drinking water supply of all of the Darwin region of about 140,000 people. Um, so this plan allocates twice that volume every year. Um, it'll allow for at full production, all that water to be used again and again and again. And I guess critically, uh, an estimated sustainable yield should, in theory, be able to be a resource that can be used into perpetuity. Um, but as we'll discover, we this is why we think it allocates too much water because it will have catastrophic impacts to ecological and cultural values that are dependent on the shallow groundwater system at the surface. Um, so basically, this plan, after 50 years, will have lowered the groundwater table by five metres across over a 100 kilometre stretch uh, of uh, the plan area, um, which puts at risk of damaging and destroying groundwater dependent trees. Um, so when we're talking about a shallow groundwater table, so we're talking about groundwater here. So below the surface, um, it could be a couple of metres, it could be up to five metres, it could be 15 metres. Um, some of these species, so these are six different groundwater dependent vegetation um, that exist in the West Devonport region, and their roots rely on the shallow groundwater below the surface. Um, so say the river red gums, um, one of the biggest species here, their roots can probably go the deepest, and that's about 15 metres below the surface, potentially up to 20 metres. So when we're talking about the groundwater table being lowered, um, where it may be at a starting point five or 10 metres below the surface, uh, when we're talking about a further five metre depletion, this puts species at significant risk. Um, and after 50 years for a 40 kilometre stretch, the groundwater table will be lowered by 20 metres. So that's kind of guaranteed for groundwater dependent vegetation in a 40 kilometre area that they will not be able to, that, that they will die. Um, so these species rely on the shallow groundwater. Um, and I guess it's important to emphasise um, why these species are so significant. Um, this is the semi-arid zone. Surface water is rare. Um, so these species are the significant vegetation in the landscape. They're also unique. Um, ground, shallow groundwater systems aren't the common norm, um, but they are defining features of the landscapes. Um, so when, say we're talking about Mbantua Alice Springs and the Lower Mbantua and the Todd River, there's the majestic river red gums that are kind of the defining feature of this place and carry significant ecological and cultural values. Uh, those species, there's a water plan, water allocation plan for this region. Um, there's rules in there that will protect those species, but just 300 kilometers up the road, those same rules don't apply. Um, we've got rules here that will result in the destruction of groundwater dependent ecosystems. So in addition to the reality of groundwater table being lowered, uh, there's also the rules, which I'll talk about further, um, and a new guideline uh, or guideline that's been embedded in this, which allows 30% of these species to be destroyed. Uh, and there's not a strong, there is no scientific basis for this rule. Um, and these species provide that specialised habitat in the semi-arid zone and arid zone. Um, they are kind of ecological re resilient sites in a changing climate. Um, and they often carry significant cultural values. So these are areas that should be protected 
as we're going to see hotter and more variable um, climatic systems not destroyed. Um, and I guess it's really important to emphasize that when we're talking about water, these are the, it's it's the the water is defines our landscapes. It, water truly is life for these areas where surface water is rare. So globally, trees, soaks, springs, and swamps are recognized um, for their value as ecological refuges. And I guess it's really important to also highlight that this is soakage country. Um, so, so surface water is rare. Um, so in terms of drinking water for um, many, many generations, soakage is provided um, a safe and secure water supply. Um, and that's why it's unsurprising that there's significant cultural values associated with this landscape. Um, whether it's sacred trees, whether it's springs, soaks, or the wetlands and swamps that are in this area, um, such as Thring Swamp and Wycliffe Creek. Uh, so we also argue that this is based on bad science. Uh, we know through freedom of information that this GDE guideline, which allows for the destruction of 30% of groundwater dependent ecosystems, uh, that there is basically no scientific evidence to support this position. It's uh, a pretty radical position um, to be this upfront in wanting to destroy groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, the research this has been based on has been land clearing guidelines for the daily region in uh, the top end savannas, as well as um, land clearing retention guidelines in southeastern Australia. None of these documents are relevant to the arid zone or groundwater dependent ecosystems. Um, and we've been calling for this document to be scrapped for years. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing um, it be embedded more and more uh, into kind of water planning and water licensing regime. Uh, we also know that these species uh, are more resilient to severe dry periods because they underpin a steady source of shallow groundwater. And taking away this lifeblood means that the refuges we need for climate change resilience will be lost and kind of the impacts of climate change in this way have not been considered at all. We also know that the plan um, and that this the water allocation plan completely ignores the department's own reports and its conclusions um, in the report, the risk of salinity due to irrigation development in the Western Devonport Basin, which states that the predicted salinity increase has very significant implications for the long-term viability of irrigated agriculture and that large parts of the region are at high risk of salinization, which could completely destroy and undermine the land and water resource. So there's a lot of research gaps in this region um, and instead of kind of acknowledging and working through that, uh, the Northern Territory government is kind of being very bullish and taking its own approach forward. In addition to, in terms of how uh, these kind of impacts will happen, uh, it's because this plan has been unconditionally gutted. Um, so water allocation plans in the Northern Territory have typically been one document. Uh, this plan is three. Uh, there's a background report, there's the legal documents, the statutory document. So only one of these documents um, will be gazetted, which, on, which means only one of these documents will have any kind of legal authority under the Water Act. So the Water Act has those kind of rules and guidance of how um, water allocation plans and licensing needs to um, be carried out. And then there's also the third report, which is the implementation actions. Uh, and this report, sorry, and then legal document has basically had all the important information uh, being pulled out of it. Uh, so they've been gutted of any meaningful content that gives assurance or guidance as to how water can be taken safely. Um, and this includes a failure to have objectives that will protect ecological and cultural values, the removal of considerations of risk and uncertainty out of this the one document that will have legal authority, the removal of the implementation monitoring plans from the statutory document, and the removal of the adaptation management framework out of the statutory document, um, as well as embedding in the statutory document this guideline, um, which is very problematic. We also consider this plan to be anti-democratic, um, and as we can see, and where it seeks to prevent future opportunity uh, for litigation. 
Uh, actually, one further thing I should just add here, um, just because this is very detailed, policy-heavy language. So in the Northern Territory, when we're issuing water licences, we have someone called the, the water controller. Um, and as of very recently, that's now an independent water controller um, that no longer sits within the department. Um, but the water controller in making water license decisions will not need to consider any of the information that's in the background report or the Im implementation actions. It will only need to consider what is in that statutory document, which is the draft water allocation plan, um, which we're looking at there. And that's been gutted. It's basically an empty document. It's There's very few pages in it. The, that middle document is about 25 pages, but there's only about 10 pages of actual content. Um, and it's just going through, I guess, the very basic, um, what, what is very prescribed under the Water Act of what must be done. But the Water Act does not emphasize that is all the only things that must be done. Um, so unfortunately, the Water Act being weak and lacking rigor, uh, the anti-government is attempting to take uh, advantage of that. Uh, so the gutting of this document has an even more sinister and anti-democratic objective where um, the government, um, or the Northern Territory, the minutes for the Western Devonport Tea Tree Water Advisory Committee uh, have captured kind of why. Um, it acknowledges that the majority of the committee don't want to endorse the plan, um, that, and the minutes note that although this structure is not for endorsement, it is a result of legislative responsibilities. So what does the Water Act say, and to prevent future opportunity for litigation. So essentially, we know that the Environment Centre, as well as Embarambara and Aboriginal Corporation, the native title um, uh, body represented by the Central Land Council, have each independently taken the Northern Territory Government and Fortune Agribusiness to the Northern Territory Supreme Court um, over the Singleton Licence, which sits in this plan area. Um, and now, in the minutes, it's being stressed that future licenses that they're explicitly trying to prevent future opportunity for litigation. Uh, preventing decisions made by the government from being challenged in the courts is anti-democratic and it undermines a key pillar of our Westminster system of government. Uh, in this context, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, the Western Davenport's Tea Tree Water Advisory Committee did not endorse this plan. So what is a water advisory committee? Essentially in a water planning, so an area that's developing a water allocation plan, they bring together diverse interests and perspectives and stakeholders um, that have an interest in how water is used. So for example, for this region, the water advisory committee included pastoral interests, included horticultural interests, it included um, so the, the land council and kind of cultural values interests. It included environmental interests as well as scientists um, and interests with public drinking water supply. Uh, and this plan was not endorsed by the Western Devonport Tea Tree um, Water Advisory Committee um, quite explicitly um, due to the the approach taken by the Northern Territory Government to allocate too much water and fears of the significant impacts this, this will have on ecological and cultural values. Um, and I guess important to note that kind of this new structure that we were just talking about was completely imposed on the Water Advisory Committee uh, and kind of the previous work that the Water Advisory Committee had been working on for a good nine to 12 months was completely disregarded and railroaded. Uh, so we have the Northern Territory government being incredibly bullish in establishing new rules and guidance to allocate too much water that have that will impact significant ecological and cultural values in the Western Devonport region, uh, which is a highly contested and controversial area already due to existing licenses, um, but as well as future licenses where they want to double the allocation of water of just Singleton being 40, this plan area is for 81 billion litres every year. Um, so it's a significant volume of water in a region that right now has very limited um, production 
So this is what we'd call a greenfield agricultural zone, which means also there's significant uncertainty um, and limited baseline understanding of the groundwater resource and the impacts that will have on ecological and cultural values, the impacts of bringing uh, salinity to the surface, uh, groundwater, all groundwater has salts in it. And when you're bringing groundwater to the surface, you're innately building up the concentration of salinity. Um, and the fact that these kind of considerations have been ignored by the plan is deeply concerning and problematic. And then finally, uh, this document embeds this GDA guideline, um, which we're calling dodgy. Um, we know through freedom of information and the 30% rule, as we've already discussed, that it kind of doesn't have a scientific basis. We also know that this plan was developed in one week in February 2020 and no draft was produced. Uh, we know that it was deliberately not put to the Water Advisory Committee, so that group of diverse interests um, that developed the previous plan and then, then the new Water Advisory Committee is developing this plan. Um, we also know that only one stakeholder um, was consulted on this document, and that was Fortune Agribusiness, who was the principal proponent to benefit from this plan. Um, and we also know that when this document was signed off by the department CEO, that the same day Fortune Agribusiness was sent this guideline, uh, and five months later, the department uploaded the guideline to make sure it was publicly available. Um, so this, this guideline, which has no scientific basis and will contribute towards um, a transformation of arid lands ecosystems um, and was never scrutinised uh, and was, is now just being imposed on a whole water allocation plan region. Uh, and we have significant concerns around that. Uh, and we've just gone through that. So we've got, wow, that's quite glary. Uh, but we've got five kind of action requests um, for people that want to participate in submissions. Um, so currently this plan is out for submission, should know that for public consultation uh, with submissions due this Sunday. So we're aware that this is a very uh, short, um, the deadline is fast approaching, uh, but we are calling for this uh, water allocation plan to be scrapped and rewritten with the support of the Water Advisory Committee and traditional owners endorsing this plan, um, that an objective that actually meets the environmental water requirements is reinstated into the plan. This guideline and its 30% rule is also scrapped, um, that an estimated sustainable yield is substantially reduced, um, where it demonstrates the impacts, that that impact, what impacts that will have on surface, um, on values dependent on the surface. Um, Yes. And then this is also another way too many things there, but just in terms of how can other people help in this campaign, um, engage with this process, support traditional owners and custodians um, that are being outspoken and talking about how this will be destructive for the country and cultural values and sacred sites. Um, we're encouraging people to write submissions um, and we're encouraging people when they send it to water resources to CC the environment minister, Lauren Moss, um, if you live in Abundance by Alice Springs, um, pick up uh, Letters to the Environment case card um, that you might see around town to help you write your letter and also direct your concern towards the Environment Minister, towards the Chief Minister, uh, towards the only Labor sitting member that's in Central Australia, as well as the Federal Government Minister, Marion Scrimshaw. Talk to people around what is happening in the Northern Territory, um, talk with friends and family, it's deeply confronting. It's building off an economic agenda that will that is going to seek to access water to grow the economy and increasingly has scant regard for ecological and cultural values that are dependent on that water supply. And we know that this is happening in the Northern Territory context where we have weak water laws. Uh, we have, you know, huge uh, discretion in how water can be protected and also governed and also how water can be licensed. Um, and the, we're talking about water allocation plans here. Um, they're the strongest. They're not, I guess, important to note that the environmental is 
highly specialised environmental water lawyers that consider the Northern Territory to have amongst the worst water law and, and water governance arrangements in the country. So we're seeing this kind of development at no cost with little regard uh, for how we're actually going to protect these values. And I guess the Northern Territory government will tell us, well, we've committed to a territory water plan and that we're going to reform the Water Act in the next few years. Uh, but as we'll see with this plan, if it's declared, which we are going to do everything we can to ensure it, it is not, um, the objective of the Northern Territory government is to allocate water. And if you want to do this properly, uh, you would look to develop rigour and, and in your systems, in your governance arrangements to ensure that ecological and cultural values and drinking water supplies are not going to be impacted by this level of extraction. Um, and unfortunately, the Northern Territory government is learning nothing from what's been happening in the East Coast and from the Murray-Darling Basin, um, where it's extremely costly to respond to over extraction and over allocation, both financially in terms of the economics of trying to unwind that, but also in terms of how it destroys regional communities, how it destroys significant ecological and cultural values. Uh, and it creates, um, it's just a, it's a poor outcome of water resource management. Uh, and if you want to be more involved in these campaigns ongoing, link in with uh, Alec if you're here in Central Australia or if you're anywhere in um, this country or also the environments in the Northern Territory. It's also doing brilliant campaigns around fighting for the Territory's water future uh, and looking to create effective um, and value-based improvements to kind of water planning and water law in the Northern Territory. Uh, and then just one final spruik um, is that Alec, um, which we'll hopefully hear more in the coming weeks and coming months, is also engaged in a water justice project with Running Waters Community Press. And this is being directed by Maureen Tabilia Napajimpa O'Keefe. Um, and it's a project to um, looking to making water rights strong and why the fight for water rights is, is so important. And we're really lucky and grateful to be uh, learning from and um, collaborating with Maureen on this, who's been determined for forever to protect her country and these kind of and cultural and ecological values. Uh, I guess one last spruik for submission writing. So we have been involved with the Singleton Water Licence and while we still don't have a decision uh, to do with our Supreme Court challenge, that doesn't stop Fortune Agribusiness from going through other regulatory hurdles. Um, they have their water licence technically, um, and now they also need their environmental approvals. Um, and we mobilised on this issue as well, and we saw that 80 different public submissions and the Northern Territory Environment Protection Agency decided the highest level of scrutiny and assessment is required, and that's a Tier 3 environmental impact statement. Uh, and that's actually a really significant win. It means that there'll be a lot more scrutiny placed on this project, um, which is nationally significant. Um, and we have now time, but this may take a year to two years to scrutinise this process and to better understand how uh, this project will impact ecological and cultural values. And the chair of the EPA, Paul Vogel, was quite clear um, there was a minute understanding of how cultural values will be impacted by this project. So submissions are due this Sunday, 14th of May. Um, there's a submission guide hopefully in the chat and I can put that in just after I stop sharing my screen. Um, and if you have any questions or just statements or discussion points or suggestions, um, that's a lot of talking by me. So if anyone has anything I'd like to add. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now too. Um, yeah, this is the time for it. I guess one thing I noted, um, I know the federal budget came down last night, but also the Northern Territory budget um, was released on the same day. And the Barclay is a real focus of um, economic development. And I think that 
um, they're relying on the fact that it doesn't have a high population. It has a very, you know, through colonial systems, disempowered um, population. So I think that all of us on this chat have a responsibility to, um, yeah, stand up for this incredibly precious region that is, I, I, that they're developing more than, um, like, you know, there's a whole lot of areas around Queensland and everything, but in the Northern Territory, the Barclay is really a centre for doing terrible things to the environment with very little opposition or care. So, yeah. Thanks, Alec. But also, I think, yeah, we need to stand up for the Barclay. Absolutely. Um, and I guess that's like while kind of the narrative and political economic dynamics of water and gas and kind of some of these other developmentist development developmental pathways can be grim. Um, I think it's also really important to remember that kind of water is kind of the lifeblood of so many of these environments and that there's a lot of positive opportunity to protect country and to provide platforms for people to talk about the significance of country and not accept the railroading of the Northern Territory government. Um, and that will take community resistance and commitment to that um, and also diverse fun um, ways to engage, um, but that there is a lot worth fighting for. And I think one of the take homes I've take um like I've realized is that like we can't do it without the support of the east coast of you know the population centers because the federal government needs to intervene. The Northern Territory government has proven for since since they were allowed to self-govern that they are incapable of confident self-governance and um, we need support from the East Coast or basically population centres. So we need a lot of support and we need, um, yeah, because it's just awful and it's colonial and it's fucked. <laughs> Great. Well, if is there anyone that has any other last comments? Otherwise, we might, might wrap things up. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, really appreciate uh, a Wednesday evening. There's a lot going on in the Northern Territory. Uh, if you have uh, anyone in mind, please feel free to share these resources. Um, this webinar has been recorded um, and we'll upload it on our YouTube channel. So feel free to pass it on to others too. Um, and thanks for supporting uh, Alex's work and engaging in this, this issue, which matters so much um, and is so significant and so tragic um, ongoing. And we'll, we'll keep pushing um, and for better outcomes. Thanks everyone.